And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about in this session. And the name of it is the five critical things that every man needs. Guys, and this is going to be, y'all still sitting over there. Come on over. Now, do I have to, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at y'all. Yeah, <laughs> come, come on over. Guys, I don't want to have to, because I, I feel like I got to engage everybody, so I'm going to find myself walking all over the room. But y'all can save me some time by staying close. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Guys, this is going to be more instructional and informational than motivational. But I think it's going to bless your socks off today. Um, I run an organization called Real Men Connect. If you haven't checked it out, it's realmenconnect.com. We are an identity restoration, discipleship, disciple-making ministry. We do life with each other 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are no days off in our ministry. Even while I'm at this conference, somebody is reaching out to me right now that I'm going to respond to. No different than Derek coming up to me and we're sitting down there talking and I lost track. That's our ministry. We always make time for each other. But in our ministry, and I'm probably going to give you guys more information than you need to know, but I got to share this with the world because the world doesn't know what I'm about to tell you. And I wish I was like the president of the United States or something, that I had a, a big platform to share this big secret I found out about men that nobody seems to know. And I discovered it by accident. In our organization, this discipleship ministry, we recruit men who want to be part of our community. So we have them fill out this application, this application. On the application, they ask them all types of things about their lives and that kind of stuff. And I said, okay, this is cool. It's a long application, very personable. And I said, this is what we're going to base our ministry on. And one part of the application, I just threw it in just by accident. But I realized now it was not an accident. God was trying to tell me something. And I asked five questions. Five questions. All they have to answer is yes or no. If they said yes, I start scoring their application by giving them one point. Now, I know a lot of you may not have done well in math, but if there's five questions and you say yes five times, what's the maximum amount of points you can get? Five. If you answer no to all of them, what's the maximum points you're going to get? Zero. Now, put a pin in that right now. As I explained that, we'll get back to the application. Well, I also host a podcast. And if you look in your program, we have the top-rated podcast in the world for Christian men on Apple Podcasts called Real Men Connect. Three million subscribers to our podcast that I started. Now, on that podcast, I interview men about their comeback stories. You know what I'm talking about. You done screwed up your life. I'm a poster child for that. My story is I went from rags to riches to ruin to redemption. I'm in the redemption part of my life. So I get redemption stories. Aren't they the greatest stories in the world? When you say, man, that guy more screwed up than me and God used him? That's the kind of stories I look for. So I'm interviewing guys, and I'm a little bit slow. When I got to around 150 interviews, where are we right now? 735. When I got to around 150, I noticed something. Everybody comeback story was similar to mine. But yet, they're from all over the world. Different cultures, different ages, different races. How is that possible that we have the same story of doing the same things? Then I came to this conclusion. We stole it from the Bible. We had to. We had to plagiarize this. We couldn't possibly have come up with this on our own. And guess what I noticed that we all had in common? How many things? Five things. Are y'all five? I ain't losing you. Am I, am I losing you yet? All right. Five things. I'm like, this is crazy. So let me put that on the application. Are you following me so far? Are y'all ready with the world doesn't know? And I'm going to share with you guys for the first time I've shared it in public. I don't even mention it on the podcast. Are y'all ready for this? Every pastor should hear what I'm about to tell you right now. 
We took in about 250 applications from men all over the world, different countries. And I scored every application. Anybody who submits an application, this is what draws them. I've screwed up my life and I need help. Can you help me? Oh, you want me to fill out this application? Do you see the type of man we're getting? I didn't lose you, right? Check this out. I can't make this up. Every man approaches us that way. I looked at every application and scored them all. Are y'all ready for what I'm getting ready to tell you? Don't lose your lunch. It is going to freak you out. 100% of the men who filled out that application, what percentage? 100% scored a two or less. Every one of them. See, y'all obviously are not pastors. That don't freak you out. All of them. They don't even know each other. Oh, obviously you're you're neither a pastor or a professor. I used to be a professor. There's something called quantitative analysis. Qualitative analysis, where you do research. There's always a variance. Three to five percent outliers. In other words, there should be at least three percent that just kind of messed up the curve. Do you follow what I'm saying? But what percentage did I say? That's not even the shocking part. Y'all ready for the rest? Because y'all, that didn't even touch you. Are y'all ready for the rest? Are y'all ready for what I'm getting ready to tell you right now? The 100% who scored two or less, 70, I think like 73% scored a one or a zero of that 100%. What? Y'all, yeah, yeah. Do y'all hear, do you understand what I'm telling you right now? So here's the obvious thing. Wait a minute, all of them? And I said, God, this can't be right. This is impossible data. God, I've done research. I've written a dissertation. I've done research. This is impossible. The, the law of averages, this, this not, don't make sense. And then God took me to Scripture. And the Scripture was, and I wish I can remember the address, but the Scripture was this. If anyone, Jesus said, if anyone should come to the Father, he must go through the Son. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. He says, what's the exception to that? There, there, there is no exception. He says, you know why there is no exception to those five? Because you stole it from the Bible because my son walked in all five of those things. And if you're walking like Christ... You're going to look like Christ, and you're going to reflect Christ to others. Y'all ready for the five things now? I had to set the stage because you wouldn't appreciate what I'm sharing with you right now. It ain't about the message. It's the content. Five things. Five. It doesn't guarantee you anything. But what it will guarantee you, that you will look like Christ and walk like Christ did. Here's the first one. And it's the most important one, and this is where we stop. When I told you that it's about 73% scared of one or zero, this is what they thought until they found out it's deeper than that. The first one, a personal, intimate relationship with Christ. And guess what we all think and why we said, I know that already. And guess what, men, after about maybe a five or ten minute conversation, with me. Guess what they realized after they talked to me about that first one? I don't have that either. They have religion. Remember Chris talked about this morning? Relationship. And here's how we can expose religion. How do you know you're a good Christian? Joe, because I go to church every Sunday. I'm there when the door is open, when it closes. I read my Bible every day. I, I, I pray every day. I don't miss a day. These are the good Christians. I pray every day. I praise and worship. I do all of that. I I pray every day. 
That's relationship? Let's flip the script. I told you I love my wife, and I have a relationship with my wife. Joe, how do you know you're a good husband? Here's why. Y'all ready? I read about my wife every day. I talk about my wife every day to people. I sing and praise about my wife all the time. I ask her for stuff all the time. I'm always asking her to give me stuff. And oh, by the way, I go to a place every week where they talk about my wife too. And we ask her for stuff. Does that sound like a relationship? That sounds like religion. But what if I told you that, Joe, you love your wife? You have a relationship with your wife? Yes, I do. How do you know? Because I know my wife. She knows me. When I speak to my wife, I am naked and unashamed. I can fall apart in front of my wife with no blame, no guilt, no condemnation. I pursue her heart and she pursues mine. I meet with her and she listens to me and I listen to her. I ask her questions and she responds back to me. Tell me what can I do to be even closer to her? She weeps with me. She rejoices with me. We know each other. Is that religion or relationship? Do you have that relationship with God? You know, Ted, we were talking, and I tell you, I said I was going to make this relatable. God sent me in a different direction. Because you, like, you always say, I thought Joe's not, I'm not, he told me not to talk about it. And I really wanted to talk about it. He said, make it plain. Someone make it plain. Do you have relationship or religion? If you just have religion, guess what? You don't get a point for that on the application. Do you get it? We're trying to build relationship. Why are we trying to build that relationship? Because we need to have our identity in Christ. Not in what we do. Not in what we've done. Not what's been done to us. Not in our past, a relationship with them right now. That's the most important thing. Here's where we stop. That's all I need. Now, did Jesus have a personal, intimate relationship with the Father? Yes. Did Jesus just go to church? Did he just read Scripture? What did Jesus do? He had a personal, intimate relationship with the Father where he would talk to the Father. To the point he says, I got to get away from you and get into his presence because I can't deal with you unless he deals with me. Are you catching this? This is why I'm not a pastor. This is why I'm not a pastor. If this is my church, you guys came in, and some of you, if you've ever been to um, any churches in the South, it goes like this. Boy, I got a message for you guys today. Woo! Boy, God's been working on my heart, and he's got me a message. And, yeah, man, get ready to take out your pens and pads. I'm going to give you all some notes, and we're going to be. Let me tell you how the Lord's moving on my heart today. Wait. Now, this is what I, if I was pastor. Nah. Yeah, he did, but I'm not going to do it. Ted, I'm not going to preach today. Why don't you come up here and tell us about your time with God this week and what he's told you and share it with us. Are you ready? Come on up. How many of you, when we show up on Sunday, we're ready to say, no, pastor, I can give the message today because God's been dealing with my heart this whole week because I don't just seek him on Sunday. I seek him every day. That's a relationship. If you're not ready to give a sermon every Sunday, you got religion. God's, he, I'm the only one he's talking to. I'm ready to preach every Sunday. Because God's been dealing with me in my quiet time. Here's what a quiet time is not. Reading a devotional. That's somebody else's quiet time. News flash. You should be able to write your own devotional. Based on your encounter with God. Based on your relationship with God. I love reading devotionals. But that's somebody else's quiet time. Where's yours? What do you think the pastor's doing when they come up here to speak? They had quiet time with God. 
and they're letting you in on the conversation. They ain't special. Pastor Plummer, I don't see the difference. They just have a relationship that we all should want to have with our father. But I don't want to spend too much time on it because that's the most important one. But it doesn't stop because Jesus had all of these. Now, I debated God about the fifth one, but we'll get to that in a second. Here's number two. Got to have a personal intimate relationship with Christ, a real one, not religion. Two, guys, we have to be in community. Everybody say community. That's connection. We can't do life alone. Ted, God put on my heart before I came up. He said, no, you ain't giving that message. Give this message. Keep it plain. Did Jesus do life by himself? And he was perfect in every way. And he chose not to do life by himself. He surrounded himself with a community of men who, guess what? They prayed together. They ate together. They laughed together. They cried together. They served together. They worked together. He didn't need them. Then why did he choose them? To be an example for us. But how many men we know are still trying to do life alone? So I ask men, who's in your community? I ain't talking about the guys you see once a week. I'm talking about the guys you talk to every day. Because last time I checked, the devil don't take days off. You know how much trouble you can get in in six days? Without community? I can't tell you the number of calls I got to return when I go to the airport today. Of people checking in on me to see how I'm doing. Me checking in on them. Is it inconvenient? Yes. Is it necessary? Yes. Community. We all need a place where we can go where it is safe to share. A place where we can heal and grow amid our struggles and our weaknesses. Jesus had it. And he's saying, follow me. Follow me. Do what you see me do. That's the second. Here's the third. Jesus didn't stop at community. He also had connection through an inner circle of guys. How we miss this. How I miss this most of my life. Yes, you have a community of men. Some are at your church. But, guys, let's, be, let's keep it 100. Let's keep, keep real right now. Let's say this was my church, right? And let's say I got good relationship with guys at this church. They're part of my community. What if one Sunday they said, we're having testimonial Sunday, and you can share what you want to share because we're all family here. Um, anybody want to share? Yeah, I raise my hand. Yeah, Joe, you want to come up here and share? Yeah, yeah, come up and share. What happened? Now, these are my guys who I go to church with all the time. Joe, yes, I'm here. Yes, yes. Thank you. I love my church family. Y'all are so wonderful. I just wanted to, you know, and I feel this is the only place I can share it. So I want to tell you guys that I've been really, really struggling. Um, I've been having same-sex attraction, and for some reason, I'm attracted to little boys for some reason. I just can't stop myself, and I can't help myself. And it's been so strong. I can't. Sometimes it's keeping me up at night, and I just have these fantasies and everything. Thank you for letting me share that. I really appreciate it. What do you think is going to happen with the men of that church or members of that church? Are they all going to be loving on me after that? Let's keep it 100. They're going to pray for me, but some are going to keep their kids from being around me. Some are going to look at me funny and sideways. That's why Jesus didn't stop at community. Jesus also had an inner circle of guys around him. See, even in your community, there's certain things you can't even tell your community because they will judge you. They will look at you funny. He said, well, Jesus had an inner circle. Read your Bible. When Jesus was at his highest moments and his lowest moments, and when he had some of the most intimate, craziest moments, and guess what? Chris mentioned it this morning. 
it wasn't all the disciples with him. It happened to be the same three people. What a coincidence. And guess what? You already know who the three were. Who were the three? Say it loud. You read your Bible, Peter, James, and John. Why them every time? And you notice what Jesus would tell them after Mount Transfiguration, Garden of Gethsemane, when um, 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 Jairus' daughter, don't tell anybody. What's that called? A freaking secret. Why didn't he tell that to the other nine? Why only three? It's called a clue. Yes, you love your brothers, but you better at least find three that you can fall apart in front of, tell your deepest, darkest secrets, and they won't look at you funny. Guess what? When you go to jail, they won't cuss you out. They'll bail you out first. You know what I'm talking about? Those guys who they don't care what, they're the ones who will come visit you in prison after you've been convicted as a pedophile. Oh, you haven't found friends like that? Wait till you do. You'll love them as much as I do. I love guys like that. That no matter what I do, they're going to love me, even if you don't. Now, I've been blessed that I got more than 12 in my community. I got at least about 200. Do you need that many? No. But a man is only as strong as the number of godly men he has on his team. Guys, look at me. I'm five for nothing and a hundred and nothing, right? But don't let my size fool you. Because I can guarantee you I'm probably stronger than 99% of you in this room. No, you know, Joe, I'm already, I can bench press you like that. No, 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 no. You're looking at how much you can lift. What's your bench, oh, what's your max? Oh, Joe, I can, I can bench press 450 pounds. That's your max? That's nothing to me. I can do that with my pinkies. Joe, you're lying. You're in church, you're lying. No, 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 no. I can always lift more than you if I have more spotters than you. Try lifting 450 pounds by yourself when I got 100 on that side and 100 on that side. Lift him. Who you think can outlift who? And the weight of life gets so freaking heavy. And what do we do? I got this. I got it. No, I don't need any help. I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm not doing that. Guess what? Life is heavy. Can y'all get this for me? Whew, thank you. Whew. All right, I'll get it a little bit. Y'all just keep lifting it to me for a while. All right. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. That's how life was meant to be lived. We are to bear one another's burdens. Guys, you ever moved? I hate relocating. Sometimes I say, you know what? Buy the house and keep the furniture. I don't care. I just don't want to move it. You can move that furniture by yourself. Or is it easier with some help? Guys, you ever try to move a couch or refrigerator by yourself? You need help. Guess what? I want to be in your inner circle, not to lift the couch for you to grab the other end. Who do you have in your inner circle? You need them. I got about at least maybe 30 in my inner circle. You don't need that many. And how do I know they're in my inner circle? If I said I was going to divorce my wife, there would be at least 30 men on my lawn before I get home tonight. You don't have that? Somebody who will fight for your marriage even more than you would? That's who I hang with. Who's in your circle? Jesus had it. Let's go to number four. Not only must you have a personal intimate relationship with Christ, have community, have connection to an inner circle. Number four, you have to have coaching, a mentor, a Paul in your life, somebody that's pouring into you. It doesn't matter the age. They just need to be spiritually a little bit ahead of you. I tell my son, I have a grown son who's 26 years old. I tell him, I say, Kendall, age doesn't make you wise. It just makes you old. Let me say that again for some of the older people here. Just because you old don't mean you're wise. It just means you old. Spiritual maturity 
It's about what's in you, not your age and the rings around you. Wisdom doesn't come with an age. Jesus was teaching at 12. Wisdom. We all need somebody in our life. You know what, Ted, I I wanted to use, I I didn't go there. Because here's one of the most simple examples. Tell me in the history of mankind, who did you ever see win any championship, world championship, in any sport without a coach? Name one. Any? Ever? Ever, ever? None. Yet you ask the average man, do you want to be a successful husband? Do you want to be a successful father? Do you want to be a good spiritual leader? Do you want to be the champion of your home? Yes. Where's your coach? I don't have one. You are deceived. So you will be the first to do it without a coach. When no one in history has ever done it. Timothy had Paul. Elijah had Elijah. David had Nathan. Joshua had Moses. Moses had Jethro. That's called a clue. Every great man of God had somebody point. Lot had Abraham. Where's your coach? Who's your coach? Jesus, who was without sin, didn't have anybody spiritually more between him. Who was Jesus' coach? The Father. And you know what got Jesus in trouble? When he had, had the audacity to utter these words, I only do and say what the Father does and say. What? Blasphemy. He said the Father speaks to him. Come on now. He was telling the truth. Guys, we can't do it without a coach. I got six of them. That's why I'm not ready to slip my wrist when my dad abandoned me. Because guess what? God gave me six more to replace him. They're not my biological fathers. They're my spiritual fathers. I restored my relationship with my dad. But guess what I don't seek my dad for? Spiritual advice. I seek these men who have kids of their own who pour into my life. Who's porn in New York? Now, does that application make a little bit more sense now? Do you have a personal intimate relationship with Christ? Do you have a community of godly men around you who are pursuing the same goal that you're pursuing and you're holding each other accountable on a daily basis? Do you have an inner circle group of men in your life who you can fall apart in front of and not be embarrassed or ashamed? Do you have a coach or a mentor or teacher who is spiritually pouring into you so you can go farther, higher, and deeper in your relationship with Christ. And here's the fifth one. And I debated God on this one. I said, God, Jesus didn't have that. But I noticed all these men who wrote their comeback stories did, including me. They had counseling for their past trauma, for their past hurts. For the pain of their past. Counseling. So I debated God on this one. I said, God, now I see everything else in Scripture. I don't, Jesus didn't get counseling. He was the counselor. Jesus didn't have to go, Jesus didn't have the trauma that I had or you had. He was without sin. We're not. So what did Jesus say? I must leave. I know y'all want me to stay here, but I can't stay here. I have to go. You would want me to go because when I go, I'm going to send another, a guide to lead you in spirit and in truth, a guide, a, a comforter, a what? Counselor to lead you in spirit and in truth when it comes to spiritual matters. You don't need to depend on a pastor for the word. You got the Holy Spirit living in you. But guess what you do need help with? Being molested. Watching your mother kill herself. Or a family member commit suicide. Lose somebody to cancer. If you don't express that, guess what? 
and you decide to um, suppress it, you're going to be oppressed by the enemy, and he's going to use it against you. Counseling is something that every man needs, but no man wants unless it's court mandated or his wife threatens divorce. And that is crazy. And you know why we don't like to get counseling? Because we've abused counseling. We go to counseling after we even blew up the marriage. Let's get counseling. That wasn't what counseling was meant for. Counseling was meant to maintain strength not rescue and save a marriage. Think about this, your car. Guess what? If you take it in for an oil change on a regular basis, you can maintain the car. Is it cheaper to take your car in for an oil change or to get an engine overhaul? An oil change. Why not look at counseling the same way? I go to counseling at least three to four times a year. They said, Joe, what are you going to counseling for? You're, you're, you're not being threatened with a divorce. I said, because it's cheaper to go to counseling three or four times a year than three times a week. Do the math. I'm trying to prevent something from happening. I need someone to ask me the tough questions. Are you making your family a priority? Is there a date night with you and your wife? Do you have a da- daddy-daughter date with your daughter? Are you spending time with your son? Are you listening to him? Are you being intentional? I go into counseling to check the air pressure on the tires, to the, the check the rotation. I want you to check, check all the fluids. Make sure. Am I good? Yes. Isn't it easier to go to a doctor for a checkup twice a year than after you've been diagnosed with cancer? I get a medical checkup twice a year. They only recommend one. What's the big deal going twice? I just want to be safe. That's called common sense. Counseling. Guys, there's no more complicated than that. Five basic things. And the natural inclination as I went through those five is to ask yourself, do I have these things in place? If you don't have these things in place, no matter where you are, guess what? Something's coming. It's coming. But I have yet, in over 735 episodes of my podcast, Over 700 interviews, never had a guy come to us in our ministry saying this, Joe, I am solid in all five of these areas, and my life sucks. Not one. Not one. That's called a clue. Doesn't guarantee anything, but I haven't had a man come to us yet who scored over a two. Not one. Guys, I'm going to close with this because I think we're going a little bit over time, but I want to close with something I used to do with my students in my class. I used to give them a quote of the day on the last day of class because I didn't know if I'd ever see them again. And I wanted them to remember something that they could hold with them the rest of their life. And I used to give a quote of the day every day. But at the last day, they couldn't wait for the last day because they figured he's probably saving the best quote for last. So they're on pins and needles on the last day. What has Dr. Joe been saving for the whole school year to share with us? He's given us a lot of quotes. I can't wait to hear this one. They're always disappointed. And I'm going to share that same quote with you. I said, class, if you want to be successful at anything, it is very easy. Watch what most people would do in a given situation and do the total opposite. They said, that's it. I said, that's it. Watch what the average person would do in a given situation and do the total opposite. Nine times out of ten, you'll be more successful than the average person. They said, well, well, Dr. Martin, what about that ten times? I said, well, you're going to prison, but it's worth the risk. I like my chances, 90% of them not going to prison. There's a 10% chance you might go to prison, but it's okay. But that means you're going to be different. You can't make a difference unless you are different. And they still scratch their head. I don't understand. I said, well, maybe you'll understand if I put it this way. And guys, I'm going to close with this. While most men have chosen to be part of the problem, make sure you choose to be part of the solution. While most or going around asking why, you just make sure you ask, well, why not? While most men will accept defeat, you accept the challenge to compete. While most men will be overwhelmed by difficulties, you make sure you transform them into opportunities. While most men will lose all hope, you remain hopeful. 
while most men were resolved to just talk about what they're going to do, you make sure you resolve to take action. While most men will complain about whence they came, don't you ever forgot, forget who's brought you this far. And while most men, dads and husbands and leaders, wish they were like you, wish they were like you, you just thank God you're not like most. So as you return back to your church, but more importantly to your homes, guys, I don't want you to be like everybody else. I want you to be different so you can make a difference. God bless you guys. Thank you for having me again.